Hey everyone, in this video I want to explore Azure Front Door. Why we have it, how it works. As always, if this is useful, please like, subscribe, comment and share. And don't forget to hit that bell icon to get notified of new content. So as a provider of some service, I want to make sure that my customers, my partners, whoever that may be, can always reliably get to my service. So what that typically means is, as I think about offering my service, I wanna offer it from different places. In Azure, for example, I would think about, well, I wanna make sure I offer it from different regions. So I could think about, hey, I might have an instance in kind of East US. I also might have an instance in maybe West US. You kind of get the idea. I'd have it in different places. I might even want to offer it, for example, in on-premises locations. It might be in some other cloud. And if I think about, hey, I have those in multiple locations from a resiliency perspective, in case one of them is unavailable, in terms of simply, hey, a proximity. Maybe I have some in Europe. So if my customers are in Europe, I wanna to go to an instance that's in Europe so they get a lower latency, so they get a better overall performance. So these are all, I can think about these as origins. These are places that are offering the service that I want to make available. Now, if I think about my end user, so those are kind of where my content is, and then obviously I have some kind of end user. And what I don't wanna to have to do is give that end user a bunch of different URLs. Hey, if you're traveling on the East Coast, go to this one. If you're on West Coast, go to that one. Hey, if it doesn't work, we'll try this one instead. That, that's a terrible end user experience. So what I really wanna think about is some kind of global load balancing solution. The idea that I can give them a single endpoint and that service, whatever that might be, will take care of directing them to maybe whichever one is closest to them that is healthy, that is responding to some kind of health probe that is global load balancer solution is actually doing. Now there are solutions like Traffic Manager. Traffic Manager works through DNS. It will really work for anything but it's all based around DNS records, and then I have to think about the time to live of those DNS records. There are things like the Azure Global Load Balancer, that's a layer four solution, so it understands TCP, UDP, but doesn't understand things like HTTPS, so I can't offload, it can't do cookie-based affinity, it doesn't understand the idea of the URL, so there's limitations to the functionality it can actually do. So what I actually wanna think about for Azure Front Door, which is our focus, is the service I'm actually offering, I'm thinking of this as kind of HTTP, maybe S, HTTP2. So I'm thinking layer seven. So that's kind of the key point for what we're dealing with here. So when I think of Azure Front Door, Azure Front Door is a global layer seven load balancing solution. Now I drew the idea of these origins. The reality is for Azure Front Door, that origin can actually be any public IP or public resolvable DNS name. Now, when I talk about Azure Front Door, there is kind of the, the V1 and now these V2 SKUs, these standard and premium. So additionally, if I'm using the premium V2 SKU, it also supports private endpoints. So remember a private endpoint is essentially an, an IP address from our virtual network that represents some service. So ordinarily that service might have a public IP, but with private endpoints, it is available through this IP on my virtual network. It gets an IP from a subnet that I specify. So for the premium V2, not only can it point to public IPs and publicly resolvable DNS names, it can also have private endpoints as origins for where this Azure front door is actually gonna go and talk to. 
So that's kind of a key point. Okay, so we, we get that idea. Hey, there's services I'm offering. I want this kind of global load balancer. So how does Azure Front Door actually work? Well, I can think about Microsoft run one of the biggest networks in the world. I can think about this huge global network. And it does connect, obviously, to all of the kind of Azure regions. But it also has lots of kind of points of presence all around the world. Now, these kind of edge locations are used for different things. Some of these edge locations might connect to different internet service providers, i.e. makes it part of the internet. The internet is just a bunch of routed networks. For example, maybe that's how I get to my on-premises. Maybe I'm using it as a meet me for express routes or a private connectivity to my on-premises. But some of them are also used as part of a content delivery network. So I can think about the POPs, these points of presence, is this content delivery network. So the content delivery network is all about, hey, this geographically distributed set of content. So I, if I have some static content, maybe images, other media files, whatever it might be, I can deploy that or cache it in the content delivery network so it's now globally available. Um, the benefit of that is now, hey, my customers, wherever they may be, can go and get to it from somewhere local to them. So this content delivery network that Microsoft runs, well, hey, guess what? These points of presence are the same ones we're using for front door. So when we have front door, we call them edges. But they are the same locations, it's the same thing. So if we were to go and look at, for example, the content delivery network locations, so if we look at the Azure CDN, we can see all of the different places, the cities where that content delivery network is actually present. So you can see there's a massive number of those. Well, if I go and look at the Azure front door list of locations, um, yeah, it looks very, very similar. It's the same list. So where we have the content delivery network pops, they are also used by Azure front door. So it's that same set of things. Okay, so that's great. How does it actually work? So Azure Front Door does a number of actually different things. So we're gonna create this Azure Front Door front end endpoint. And the first thing that does is it's available via Anycast. So I can think about, we have all these points of presence. So what Front Door is actually going to do is firstly make it available via Anycast. What Anycast means is, hey, there's an IP address that represents my service, but instead of the normal kind of, hey, that IP address is available in one place, it's being advertised through all of these points of presence. And so wherever I am, I'm gonna go to the one that's closest to it. So straight away, that gives me some nice benefit and performance improvement that, hey, I'm gonna go to a place close to me. The next thing it does though, is in addition to any cast, it uses split TCP. So what does this mean? So if I think of a regular kind of connection, so let's say this user for a second, and what we'll actually do, let's move them over a little bit. So this user, um, we are talking to this point over here. So ordinarily what would happen is as part of that communication, it would say, okay, I go to here over this and then back. That's to establish the TCP. Then I have to establish the TLS. Once again, there's kind of some back and forth there. And then I'm constantly going back and forth with various requests for content. And then I get the various responses. So all of the time, it's going back and forth all the way to this backend origin. So that takes a certain amount of time. It's gonna introduce a certain amount of latency. So the first thing that happens is with front door and that split TCP is now imagine I have another user. 
So let's draw another user in here, make this user purple. So let's say I'm sitting here. The split TCP now says when I'm establishing that initial TCP session, well, it's actually established with that edge. Then the TLS is established with the edge. And then when I'm requesting content, it typically is requested in small chunks. Hey, I make some request. And at this point, it will go to whichever backend is closest, but it will get kind of a big chunk of data. So a bigger chunk of it, it gets that response back. And then it can send the responses. But you can see here, I'm improving the overall performance because now all of that initial setting up of the session is local. And then when I'm doing requests, hey, it's intelligent enough to say, hey, I'm requesting this part of the content, but I'll maybe go and get this bigger chunk so I'm ready and can serve up those future smaller requests and give those responses with a much better performance straight away. So without any caching or anything else, I'm improving that overall end user's performance. But it is layer seven. So if I think about, okay, we are having those additional capabilities, I can do other things. So now I can think about, yes, front door, any cast, available at all those edge locations for front door, split TCP, giving this great performance. But additionally now as well, I can add in things like, hey, I can do SSL offload because we're layer seven. We understand those things. I can do caching. So now the first user goes and does some request. And yes, I, it has to go to the back end to get the data to serve it up. But the second user that asks for that same content, well, that gets pre-cached. So it's going to be even a better performance for that next person. We can do things like compression. So I can actually reduce the amount of data. I can do cookie-based affinity. And these things will all look very familiar. Um, if I look at App Gateway, which is a layer seven regional solution, it does all of the same things. And one of the other nice things I can do here is things like a URL rewrite. So I can actually change the URL and I can even do a redirect. So I get a whole bunch of very nice layer seven capabilities through this. So that's the, the basic kind of fundamentals of what we're doing with Azure Front Door. So I can think about, hey, I have instances of services which can really be anywhere. Yes, they can be in Azure, any kind of service that offers a public uh, endpoint, but it could be any public endpoint on premises, other clouds, just has to be publicly accessible IP or publicly resolvable DNS name. If I'm using kind of that V2 premium SKU, I can also have private endpoints. So now let's kind of put this into reality. So that's how it works at a theoretical level. Let's actually kind of see this. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create an instance of Azure Front Door. So I go ahead and I create my Azure Front Door. And I'm gonna say instance. You'll also kind of see references uh, when I think about kind of a profile. But it's a particular instantiation of Azure Front Door. Now, one of the things that's interesting, and it makes sense, most services in Azure, when we create them, we pick a region. Well, remember, Azure Front Door, the whole point of this is it's global. So I don't pick a region. I say, hey, I wanna create an Azure Front Door instance. I don't pick any region because it's global. So it's gonna kind of be available everywhere. Now, there are various components that go into this particular instance, which I'm gonna talk about, and there are certain scale limitations. So if we actually dive into this for a second, if we look, these are all of the service limits for the V2. And again, I'm focusing on the V2. There is also kind of the current 
GA as your front door, but I'm focusing on the Future, the V2, the Standard and Premium. I don't know what the current one's gonna be called, maybe it's gonna be Classic, I don't know, some, <laughs> some name. But understand, so we can see here the SKU limits for both the Standard and the Premium. So these are important to understand because as we start creating these, my ultimate goal is to just have one Azure Front Door instance. If I can, I don't want to create multiple ones. But these scale numbers, well, these could be reasons that, hey, I, I have to create additional instances of them. So understand that all these limits, all of these are linked in the description below. And one of the interesting things is this V2 SKU really combines a whole set of additional features. So we had front door before, but what this V2 is doing is combining features of the content delivery network that was kind of separate before, and it's combining things like the, the WAF, the Web Application Firewall, and those other security capabilities to come into this all up V2 offering. Standard does have WAF, you can turn on, but it's only custom rules I create, whereas Premium has a whole set of standard rule sets. It has bot protection, it has that private link support. In fact, there's an article that goes through the feature comparison of the standard and the premium. And really the big difference comes down to this area here. And it really is about these kind of advanced security. So this private link offering, standard only has custom rules, but again, the premium has those additional built in, um, the OWASP standard rule sets and I get bot protection with the premium as well. So those are really the key differences. And I think also we see, yeah, there's a security report down at the bottom. And this kind of shows a nice picture of what I was just talking about. So what these new V2 SKUs are doing, it's combining the idea of the old Azure front door, that great intelligent layer seven routing with the content delivery network and the Azure Web Application Firewall. So that's really what it's focused around. And as I was saying, I want to try and focus, if I can, on just having one instance of Azure Front Door. The reasons I might create additional instances are scale. Hey, I need to go beyond what I can do with a single instance. It could just be manageability, uh, the sets of various routes and the rules that I'm creating. It could also be just from a, hey, I have different departments, and those departments want to be able to manage completely separately. So those might be reasons I would create additional instances of Azure Front Door. But if we go and think about the actual components, so the first ones are origin groups. These are the things that are actually offering the content. So I'm gonna have these origin groups. And I can create multiple origin groups. So I can kind of think about these really as the back ends. Things that are offering this content. And again, I might have a different set of back ends. I can have multiple origin groups. The key point of this, remember, is publicly accessible. Now, if these are all private endpoints, if it's the V2 premium, if this was a typical Azure service, most likely this is probably gonna be an Azure App Gateway. That's a very common pattern. Remember Azure App Gateway is a regional, so it exists within a region, layer seven load balancer. So it's super, super logical in terms of architecture to have, hey, layer seven Azure App Gateway is distributing to the instances within the region, and I have multiple of those, and then front door to balance between those Azure AppGate instances. So that would give me that nice kind of resiliency and distribution within region, and then that geo distribution of those services. But it does not have to be. There's no, hey, I have to use that. It's just a very common pattern. It could be storage account, a web app, a Kubernetes instances, really anything you want. And it's using health probes to check, hey, it's there and it's healthy. So let's take a quick look at this. If we jump over for a second, and if I go and look at my, so I've created a front door. Again, if I did create, you can pick, hey, a front door standard premium. And if I do a quick create, 
it's not going to ask me for a region. It's literally just going to, hey, I want a resource group, a name, a tier, and it's going to set up some an endpoint, i.e. a front end to which things can connect to, and an origin, so something it can point to. So it's going to get you up and running with a very basic configuration. But I'm actually going to go and look at one I've created already. So mine is just a standard. And if I go to my origin groups right here, I can see, hey, yep, I've got a default origin group, which is the one it helped me create. And I can kind of see, okay, there's a root, root attached to that. But if I select my default origin group, you can see I've got two origins. Both of these are actually, uh, it's an Azure websites. I'm actually using Azure Container Instances for this. So I'm hosting two Azure Container Instances in two different regions that's hosting my actual content. You can see I've got Health Pro configurations. It's just checking HTTP, and I'm doing a very basic check on the route to make sure it's actually configuring, how it's doing that load balancing between them. And if I do add an origin, you can see there's a whole bunch of kind of Azure services that it just natively understands. In addition to public IP addresses, I can actually um, point to Traffic Manager, because remember, Traffic Manager offers a publicly resolvable DNS name, or custom. So all of these different things I can add as an origin to this particular origin group, or I could just go and add a new origin group, so a new name, so a new set of origins. Maybe it's offering a different service. So I can go and set up these various origin groups. Now, one of the things I can do within these origin groups, is if I go back to that add an origin, or you can see it here as well, I do have priority and weight. So the whole point of these is the priority would be useful if, hey, I had a certain set I wanted to use first, but then if it wasn't available, go and use a lower priority one. The weighting is useful if I want to control the distribution. So if I have a higher weight, I'll get a greater percentage of the requests coming in. So that weight can actually be really useful if maybe, hey, I'm actually rolling over to a new version of my service or something. So what I could do in terms of kind of deployment patterns, I could actually think about, hey, as I've got my new version, initially it has a fairly low weight, so it's got some of the people going to it. And as I gain confidence, I could start increasing its weight so it gets more and start lowering the weight of the other one. So it's actually a way to maybe do like a ring deployment, canary deployment, to start bringing things over to that. So that, that can be a really nice thing to do. And that's it. So it's just some publicly accessible thing. So then I need the Azure front door endpoint. So now I think about, okay, we have the front end endpoint slash kind of domains. Some of the language is a little bit strange right now. Uh, in the portal, it's I think mainly the original V1 portal and they're starting to port some things over. I would fully expect I'm showing you this now. I think some of the naming is probably gonna change. Some of the layout is probably gonna change, but the concepts will be the same. So now I create an endpoint. Now what happens here is you get some default Azure front door name. So you get some kind of x dot um, Azure, oops, that's wrong, let's go back. I'm still, this is the new whiteboard, I'm still learning my way around it. <laughs> Azure fd.net, so it's gonna give you some name. But then I can add my own custom. DNS names, and I can add multiple ones to it. Likewise, I can create additional front end endpoints. So I would now get a new Azure FD.NET name that I specify. And once again, I can add additional kind of custom domain. So even though it's one instance of Azure front door, hey look, I can have multiple sets of origins that are offering a service. I can have multiple endpoints that I would give customers that I can then do different things with. And once again, I have full configuration of this. So if we jump over once more, this time, instead of looking at the origins, 
we can actually go, well firstly, I'll go to Endpoint Manager. And what we see here is, we can see my name. So savtech fd onezurefdnet And if I copy that, and we just go to it, first of all. So there's my service. It's my standard bad father app, where it's being run on two Azure Container instances in different regions, and it's redirecting me to those. So that's been pushed out, it is available. But you notice it's also got this additional name, bfafd.onboard2azure.com. Now, I also added a second endpoint. And again, I gave it a name. So this time it was bfafd2, then it adds its standard bit at the end. And likewise, I could add additional custom names. I could add another endpoint. I would give it a name. So I can add as many endpoints as I want that I'm then gonna be able to use to have different rules assigned, different routing assigned, going to different groups of origins, i.e. things offering my service. Now, if I go to domains, this is where I can add my own custom domain. Now, I have added bfd.onboardtoazure.com. So I've already gone and actually added that. And what we can see is, if I just go over to this, if I go HTTPS, Dot com, you can see it works. Notice that's HTTPS. The certificate is good. If I go and look, yep, yeah, looks valid. I can see, oh, okay, it created me. I didn't create this cert, it did this for me. And that's a really nice feature of this. So it will give me a Microsoft managed certificate and it will manage that life cycle as well. So this is a great feature of actually using these custom domains with Azure Front Door. So as it was approved, you can see I've associated it with an endpoint, so that first one, we can see the certificate state is deployed and traffic is being delivered. Now, when you add a new domain, additionally it's gonna be sort of saying, hey, pending. And if you click that, it's gonna tell you a text record you have to add to your DNS zone. It will not validate just because you have a C name pointing to it. So if I go and look at my DNS config, we can see, hey look, here is my, here you go, BFD, AFD, it's a C name. And sure enough, it points to my Azure front door instance over here. But that's not enough to validate it. You actually have to go and create this text record. So here you can see I've got this DNS auth dot BFAFD is a text record and it gives you a text string that you have to enter. And that's what it's gonna use to actually validate, hey, I own that domain and will then add it as a custom name and then it will go and create the SSL cert for you and associate it with it. The reason it uses a text record rather than a CNAME alias, well, I think it's more secure but also imagine I already had this service running. Well, I can't validate the name by pointing it to my front door because it's not ready yet. I don't wanna to point to some service I'm setting up. So by using the text record, it lets Azure front door validate that yes, you own it without actually having to have the record pointing to front door at this time. So hey, I can do the validation. Yep, that text record has been added for front door that proves you own that DNS zone because you were able to add that record. I'm now gonna go and let you associate it with an endpoint, create the cert, it's ready to go. And then in the future, once it's up and ready, you could change that CNAME record to point to front door. So that's why it's a text record, not just checking that CNAME alias. And again, that managed lifecycle certificate is huge. So then kind of, again, for all of these, you get this nice cert that's fully managed by Microsoft. You can bring your own if you want to. You don't have to use that, but that is a phenomenal feature. And then once you've got that, once you've got that custom DNS name, you just add it to the endpoint. So in the portal, all I would have to do at this point is once that DNS name was validated, I can just go back to my kind of, in this case, I go to my endpoint manager and you would see kind of got my domains there. If I click edit endpoint, I can do add, and I could select a domain that I've not already specified. So I validated it, now I'd be able to go and 
um, select it, or I could do kind of add a new domain and do that all in one go. Or from the domain itself, I think if I remember correctly, once it's validated, I could go and associate it from here. So you've got this associate link. So there's multiple ways I can go and make that with the endpoint. But now that name is using the endpoint. Again, some of this naming I think is gonna change in the portal as this kind of goes to GA, but the concept will remain the same. Okay, so this is great. We have this idea that we have the front ends for Azure Front Door, I have multiple of my custom names with my nice managed certs. I have my groups of origins that are providing the service. How do I link those things together? And the way I link those things together is essentially we have routes. And I can have multiple routes. So I could have kind of a route one, could say, hey, from this particular custom domain, go to that set of origins. I might have a route two that, hey, from this one, uh, go to that set of origins. And then I can also have a whole set of rules. Rule one, rule two, which is where I can do clever things like real, URL rewrite, URL redirection. I could look for, hey, if someone's trying to do a put request, don't allow it. I could have certain rate limiting things. I can do a whole bunch of super cool things in here. And the whole point of these routes is they're really kind of based on, hey, what is that domain on the front end? So I'm looking at that. I'm looking at the protocol. So is it kind of HTTP, HTTPS, and then the URL path. So I'm looking at all those things. So yes, I can do path-based routing as part of this. So those are used to pick, hey, the route, and then I can have rules within there. So if we go and look at that part. Now, one of the things that's interesting right now in the portal is I, I can't see routes. I can see it in the endpoint manager. So if I go to the endpoint manager and I say edit endpoint, and then I can go to my routes, I can see my route, and I could say configure. So notice I can say, hey, is this particular route enabled or disabled? I can select the domains that it is applying to. So currently I have it applying to both that kind of default Azure front door generated name and my custom name I added. So that's why I'm picking the domains. This is where I can pick the path and then I can pick the protocol. So those are the three things that I'm really using to say, hey, is this route applying? And then once I've picked that route's applying, well, then I can do things. For example, here, hey, redirect all of it to HTTPS. Which origin group do I want to send it to? Do I want to send it to a certain path? Um, forwarding protocol, HTTP only, HTTPS match. Do I want to enable caching? What do I do with query string caching? Do I want to turn on compression? Do I have certain rules that I want to apply to this? So here, this is where, hey, if I had rules available, I could actually link various rules to this. So what are the rules? So firstly, I could add a new route. So this is where I could give it a route name, which domains I want to match on. Maybe it's a now a specific path. So I could dump the star and just do a certain path. And then I could um, pick certain things in there. But for my rule sets, I can create rules. Now I created a very silly rule and I've not associated it with any route. But I basically checked for, hey, based on a geographic match, but I could also do IP match. It's not a certain geography, it's not a certain IP. And I'm checking for United Kingdom. And then I'm overriding the origin group from the regular route to send it to a specific origin group. But I could also, if I just do add a new rule, look at all the different conditions. Device type, HTTP version, request cookies, args, query strings, remote address, request body, request file name, a huge list, request method, request path, request protocol, request URL. So request method, 
hey, look, if it equals a put, for example, well, maybe as a condition, sorry, as an action, I might redirect the URL. I might rewrite the URL. I might modify something about the request. So I have all these different things I can do. So this is where you can start to see, hey, I can do the URL redirect. I can do the URL rewrite. I could do things like rate limiting. I have all those capabilities. Actually, rate limiting is more WAF. But I have all those different capabilities that I can do within these rule sets configurations. And again, once I've created the rules, what I would then do is as part of the routes, again, if I go and edit this, you should be able to then go and select, as you can see here, language redirect. I could now associate those rules with a particular route, click update, and now that would be used. So that's how I kind of bring all the various parts together. And that, that's really all that is to it. So it's actually not super complicated, but that's super powerful. So I have the idea of groups of origins. I have my, I'm gonna to wanna to use a custom name. I'm not gonna to wanna to probably use the Azure FD.net. My custom names, I get those nice certs if I want them. Then I have different routes that do that mapping based on the domain, the protocol, the URL path to groups of origins. But as we saw using the rules, I could do things like overwrite the origin group, maybe on a certain path. I could rewrite elements, I could redirect, I could modify headers, I can really do anything I want as part of that traffic flow. So it's super powerful. Now the last part is kind of the whole web application firewall component. Now, just quickly, before I talk about web application firewall, what about distributed denial of service? So today, I get kind of the basic um, distributed denial of service protection. There's obviously the standard kind of version as well. Today, I cannot use the standard DDoS offering with Azure Front Door. So I get the basic DDoS protection as really kind of any other service, but I cannot apply standard. What I can apply is the web application firewall. So optionally, I can turn on WAF. Now WAF has its own huge sets of protections. Again, if I do standard, I can only do custom rules. If I do premium, we get those standard OWASP rule sets. I also get things like the bot protection, but I can do the geo filtering, the rate limiting, um, I have all those managed rule configurations. And that WAF actually applies right here at the edge. As do all of those nice rules that I'm doing with Azure Front Door. So one of the great things about this is it's not like it's doing overhead on my origins, on the whatever resource is providing the service. All of that intelligence, both of Azure Front Door and of WAF will be applying at the edge. So before it starts getting onto network and consuming resources, this is where I'm doing that protection, the web application firewall that I can just turn on if I want to, obviously it costs more money. But also all of those rules with um, the Azure Front Door as well. So this is the service. I mean, that's how it works. That's how it kind of all fits together. It's actually very simple in terms of the components, but this is hugely powerful if I think about, look, if really I want to make some geographically resilient service, I can't just have it in one region. So I have to think about instances in multiple regions. Maybe I am using other clouds, maybe I'm using on-premises, it doesn't matter. As long as it's publicly addressable IP address or publicly resolvable DNS name, or if it's the premium, I can use private endpoints into my VNet. Then I have these nice Azure front door names these front end endpoints, these domains, that I then map to those various origins with my routes, and then I can use the rules to do all of that, maybe custom override, URL path, redirections, rewriting, host headers, et cetera, et cetera. And again, I would think about, hey, probably I want WAF at the edge to help give me protection from those bots, those types of injection attacks, do that rate limiting capabilities, give me that really nice, not only geographical balancing between my instances, but also adding additional protection um, for my service. So that's uh, Azure Front Door. 
I hope this was useful. As always, a lot of work goes into preparing and creating these, so uh, subscribe and like really would be appreciated. But uh, until next time, good luck and uh, take care.